What's up YouTube, Daniel Carter at Afro Herp Keeper here. Uh, I'm actually at the UT Vertebrate Paleontology Lab right now, and I'm about to go on a tour with the Austin Herpetological Society, check out some of their paleontology and uh, skeletal collections. Our guide today is named Kenneth Bader. He is also a member of the Herpetological Society, and uh, he's going to be the one telling us about all the collections. So, without any further ado, let's get started. When we find a specimen in the field, we generally go through and we remove all the rock and dirt from around the fossil, clean down, and then we'll put a plaster cap over the specimen. Essentially, we'll mix burlap and plaster together, and us usually we'll put some kind of separator. We'll put newspaper over top of the fossil first, then put the burlap and plaster over top of that, wait for it to harden, and then we're able to dig underneath it, flip it over, and remove the specimen. Um, and later we'll go into the prep lab where you'll be able to see um, that next stage where after we've stored the specimen, um, we take it upstairs and we clean the dirt and rock and plaster off. This whole row going this way is almost all specimens from Plainview, Bison Jump, and Lubbock Lake, and it's just bison. I think this is a six foot horn spread. Um, I've seen them up to seven feet. This is the end of the jaw of Dinosuchus. Um, it has about a five foot long jaw for this one. There are larger individuals that are closer to six foot long skulls. And this is just one of the teeth at the end of the jaw. Dinosuchus is one of these large Cretaceous crocodiles that prowled the uh, edge of the seaway during the uh, middle to late Cretaceous and most of these nicer specimens all come out of Big Bend. So this is um, essentially a gigantic salamander. It's a 10 foot long salamander uh, and these specimens all come out of uh, the Big Spring, Texas area. So a lot of this uh, Adam Kingsville collection is stuff that we're really just storing until we actually find the time to actually go through and sort it all out. We know that there are camels and saber-toothed cats and giant ground sloths and countless bison and horses and mammoths. But over time, sorting it is kind of the problem because you have to train people to actually identify these individual bones. And that kind of training takes time. It's hard to tell if that specimen is actually crushed by the weight of sediment um, after it was buried or if it was naturally that flat of a turtle but there would have been there would have been a few turtles that would have been pushing half a ton before the pleistocene in north america there were rhinoceros we have rhino fossils um, easy phytosaur skull to pull out during the Triassic, I mentioned there are a lot of animals evolving to fill in different animal groups and niches. This is one of those animals. Uh, and this is a Triassic reptile. That, when you look at it, and the first thing you probably are thinking, gavials and the other slender sounded crocodilians. Mm -hmm. This is a phytosaur. This is an animal that's very distantly related to crocodilians. It's probably just as related to crocodilians as it is to dinosaurs. So this is an animal, it's a good example of uh, convergent evolution. This animal evolved to do the exact same thing as these fish-eating crocodiles. It has a long slender snout, it has nostrils at the top of its head. And so it's prowling the waterways grabbing mostly fish. Some of the larger ones would have been grabbing dinosaurs and other animals. So this is the snout of the whale. It was a large baleen whale. Uh, this was in the spot where it was being excavated. They are using a backhoe. And the backhoe, for support, they put the big cleats down and put the full weight of the backhoe down. 
and that went on top of the skull. They didn't know the skull was there at the time. Um, so the skull was pretty much, that part of the skull was smashed. The back of the skull was in good shape. So this jacket here. So this is one of the nicer skulls of a dire wolf. Uh, and this is from down in Ingleside. They're a little bit bigger than a modern wolf and their teeth are a little bit more massive. They probably spent a lot of time scavenging and actually crunching bones. So this is the main room where I work. This is the fossil preparation lab. My title is fossil preparator, but I also have the secondary title of uh, manager of the osteological prep lab. So I, I'm also the monster that carves out carcasses and creates skeletons. Basically, we select specimens to prepare based off of research interests and research questions. Uh, if one of our researchers or students has a strong focus where they want to work on a specific specimen, that specimen will get brought to the top of the pile for what we're working on. We have toothbrushes and little brushes. We have little blades and scalpels and the dental picks that you see on TV all the time. This is an air scribe. It's essentially a little pin-sized handheld jackhammer. This is the skull of a gothothere. It's one of these elephants from the Miocene, about 12 million years old. And this is a jacket that one of our research associates is interested in. Um, you can't see much here, but this is actually the opening for the nostril up in front of the eyes. The eyes would have been here. The trunk would have come down the front and there's a tusk here and a missing tusk here. This tusk is cut off uh, and the teeth are on this side. This is actually a penguin from the Paleocene. So it's probably around 55 million years old. And we CT scanned it to find out where all the bones are in the specimen so that we could prepare down and not damage the bones or try to avoid damaging the bones. We take the original specimen and we pour liquid silicone rubber over the top of the specimen. Once the rubber is cured and hardened, we can peel it off and we end up with an almost perfect negative of the specimen. And at this point we can either pour plaster or a liquid plastic inside of this, let it harden and pull it out and we'll end up with a pretty much three-dimensional copy. It's not necessarily good enough to actually do research off of, but it's good enough for teaching and for education. One of the current projects that I'm currently working on and preparing are mosasaurs for Josh. Turns out several of these are actually new species. So we're actually doing detailed preparation, removing the last little bits of rock from them, and he's going to be naming them. I think he's going to name at least three different species. This is the upstairs area, this is the storage area for the modern animals. For the most part everything is a uh, skeleton. We have a separate lab, a uh, couple on the other side of campus, where I'm basically taking carcasses either from the wildlife rescue or salvage from the roadside or from zoos. Uh, I've gotten a fair number of animals from reptile dealers also. I'm basically taking them and using dermestic beetles to uh, strip away the flesh. So for example, right here, this is a gavial skull. So this is the very long-snouted long gavial or gharial from India. This actually facilitates our research. We're never looking, never really looking at particulate skeletons of animals this size range. We want to be able to look at the individual bones. There are coral snakes. There's the head. I mean, that's the head of a coral snake. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you open up the container and find that it's completely fallen apart. Nice. There we go. So, Bytus nasocornis is rhino viper, so this is a rhino viper fang. 
So this is part of a um, indigo snake. So, so there's a skull. That would be one of your bigger snake skulls in Texas. Got a retic with. Um, so a lot of these guys have an actual extra row of teeth. Um, so normally you have the outer row, but these guys have an inner row on the pterygoids and the palate. And so snakes don't unhinge their jaws when they swallow something. They really just have a lot of rubbery ligaments holding the individual bones together. So they actually expand to engulf, stretch out. So I mentioned we had a researcher named uh, Juan Langston who was obsessed with crocodilians. And he actually went through and got every crocodilian he could from every zoo possible. We have probably half the species represented here. Many of them were at a time where getting these things was nearly impossible. He got Nile crocodile, he got American croc, he got Morlet's crocs. He actually did get Osteolamus, which is probably one of the harder ones to get. come out of the box. So which one's Osteolamus? Dwarf croc. Yeah. So this is one of the dwarf crocs. The guy that processed this before, that probably processed this one, is Andy Glusenkamp. When he was a graduate student here, he ran the bug room. And with a lot of these crocodilians, we've actually started just um, saving the dried skins also. It's easier to save the dried skin with all the osteoderms than to actually process it out. We do have a handful of eagles here. I have salvage permits to pick up just about any animal I find. I can pick up eagles, but I have to turn it into U.S. Fish and Wildlife within 48 hours. Um, those eagles are typically later... Uh, taken by U.S. Fish and Wildlife and they distribute the feathers uh, to the different tribes. This one's actually a bald eagle, so chances are somebody shot it. Uh, we've got three different skulls here of ostrich. So here's a soft shell. Um, soft shells don't actually have that outer ring of marginal scale or osteoderms. So here's the ribs themselves with an osteoderm on top and you can see the texture. So it's got this pitted ornamented texture um, and this is really the easiest turtle bit of turtle shell to actually identify. notorious for not being that friendly of animals. You do not want to get bit by a sloth. They're very sharp chisel-like teeth. It would be a memorable experience. Um, our other showpiece specimen is Quetzalcoatlus. So this is the humerus, the upper arm bone of this animal. This is actually the largest flying animal ever. Uh, that's from Big Ben. Quetzalcoatlus is, of course, a big pterosaur uh, with a 30 to 40 foot wingspan. Wow. So this is just one um, wrist bone from the animal. All the white is reconstructed. Well, this is the best known example. Uh, there are actually a whole bunch of other individuals from the same area. Um, so here's a neck vertebrae from a smaller animal. Um, and right now we have researchers that are working on Quetzalcoatlus to do a redescription. Um, and the general plan is they're going to describe the, redescribe the original pieces and all the new animals too and try to determine, are they actually really the same species? Because the big guy is considerably larger than the smaller ones. 
This is the uh, reconstructed wing from Quetzalcoatlus, the large flying reptile. Most of our Ice Age fossils, which are much more fragile to climate changes, are kept downstairs where it's more constant. Uh, but this upstairs swings from, I've been in here where it was very close to freezing uh, before we got the heaters up and running. Um, and I've been in here where it was 100 degrees. So this is Captorhinus. Um, it's actually a very nice skull. We can actually take these burrows and either CT scan them or we can just prep them down and get articulate skeletons of these animals. And that does include some of the uh, diplocollis. This is the maxilla of a dimetrodon. So these are Permian fossils. These are between 250 and 300 million years old. And this is kind of a period of time in the history of life where uh, a lot of these different animal groups are actually not just colonizing land, but they're diversifying on land. You have animals like true reptiles that are developing hard-shelled eggs are actually able to live completely free from water. And you're developing communities, and at this point, you start to get large predators. And so this is actually a rather large Dimetrodon skull uh, fragment from, I don't know, six-foot animal. It's a big Dimetrodon. one of the original skulls of Ariops. So this is actually one of the earlier uh, amphibians actually from that on land. Uh, or at least one of the larger ones. So these guys are crawling around in shallow swamps in uh, North Texas. There aren't a lot of rocks that have, that are the right age for Tyrannosaurus in the state of Texas. Um, and this is probably the only thing that's at least close to it. It's from Big Bend, it's roughly the right age, but it's not exactly Tyrannosaurus rex, it's probably a different species. Um, there's currently a crew from the Denver Museum that is planning on starting to excavate and hunt around in Big Bend more, and hopefully find a skeleton 